Due to technical difficulties, the quality of the following recording is not up to our usual standards. However, we are releasing this due to the importance of the material presented. So I'm going to talk about evolutionary fuzzing. Revolutionizing the field of gray box and tax service testing with evolutionary fuzzing. And if my little little HP pointer thing works, it never works, then I'm going to use it to try Yes. Okay, so I'm going to hit some quick goals, do some background, and uh, talk about the actual system that I developed, talk about some initial benchmarking, and initial results of the four main points of the talk. So at any point throughout, if you have questions, ask, there'll be time at the end. And uh, maybe if you're all very tentative, I'll let you have like 10 minutes later for lunch or something. Good? Okay. Go. No? All right, well, it's not going to work, so. So the idea is to build a better feather closer, right? That's the whole idea of the research that I'm doing. It's the point when we want to find bugs, new bugs. And uh, I don't have any proof yet that this is the way to do it, the best way to do it. In fact, I talk at the end that depending on the domain you're looking at, it makes a big difference in terms of which approach you've got to take. So to my knowledge, this is the only evolutionary buzzing tool that's been released publicly. Last year, you may have caught uh, Hamilton, Sparks, and Cunningham talking about Sidewinder. But to my knowledge, they never released code. The same thing with Bitcoin, they might have done some work, but they didn't release code. And there's other fuzzers out there, plenty of them, that use debuggers to get exceptions and all that kind of stuff, but um, not giving feedback back to the fuzzer to it. I we create better test cases. So, yeah. Talk about uh, software testing for the background. Just a uh, quick. Basically, it's tough. That's the only point of the slide. It's just to say that you can't really prove that software is secure. You can prove that there's bugs if you find bugs. And uh, it takes a lot of your budget. It's really hard. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, people are doing better at it. Microsoft's doing better at it than they were. So, testing is really all we have to uh, do comments. How do I sign up? Is it okay? Always good? Okay, good. All right, stay with me. They say that the average person in the talk zones in and out every 30 seconds. So if I stop every once in a while and go like this, come, where, what were you thinking about just now? What were you thinking about? <laughs> you, well, you were thinking about sex, you said, I know, I know. Stop thinking about sex. Focus up here, all right? Every 30 seconds, I might do that. So if I do, bear with me. Okay, so fuzzing isn't like the end all be all of testing. It just fits in this one little piece, right? And it's an important piece. And companies are, are learning, like, how many people yesterday or today, raise your hand, had a speaker mention the word fuzzing? The speaker talked about fuzzing. Yeah, so quite a few, and that's, that's good, right? So, um, this is a diagram I ripped off from Peter Olbar. He wrote a 2005 an article, a triple A article called Biomedic Assumptions of Fuzzing, and it was pretty much like that. I changed it a little bit, but it's sort of like generate test case, deliver to the application, did some problem happen? If it did, record it. If not, go out to the next test case, however you're doing either dynamically generating or randomly or taking from predetermined test cases. So um, in the monitor, it might be CPU usage, it might be memory usage, it could be if it crashed, if it got a memory access violation, um, whatever. So how many people had a speaker yesterday or today mention attack circuits? Raise your hand. Probably think about the same number of people that are fuzzing, right? So attack surface and fuzzing, people I think are really finally, probably in the last year, they really get it. They know what these terms mean. They realize that the attack surface is not all the code, right? It's actually a fairly small subset, typically. So it could be a network interface, it could be when it reads in and parses files, it could be interprocess communication. That's part of the vulnerability analyst's job or the security tester's job to figure out what is the attack surface. And it's actually kind of a tough problem to figure out if you know your code has, say, a thousand functions, how many of those thousand functions can you touch on the attack surface? That's actually a topic in and of itself that probably deserves research. So go forth, do good things, mention me in your paper. Um, come back. Everybody's back, right? Three seconds. Uh, so, what is evolutionary testing? It's kind of a fancy academic kind of sound. I like to use academic words, it makes me sound smart. So. Genetic algorithms is basically a computer science search technique that is sort of inspired by biological, so sort of like survival of the fittest. These two files, these two sessions, whatever, they did better, they got more fitness, more code coverage, is what I'm mean, using in general, diversity as well. I'll talk about that in a second. So they get together and think about what you were thinking about, and what they made, right? And they produce children, and those children do better than the next generation. That's the idea. 
So, standard um, evolutionary testing, though, as it's defined in the academic world, is mostly in, you need software. You need the source code, basically, to do it. So here's the example. You see we have this example function. It takes four arguments, A, B, C, D, four integers. And in this example, the four ends are 10, 20, 30, and 40. And we're trying to get to where the system says target slash slash target. That's where we're trying to generate test data that would take us to that point in the program. So the way we measure fitness is we basically say, OK, first is, is A greater than B. Uh, now. So we fall out of the branch, and there were two more branches left. So it's two branches plus what's 20 minus 10 is 10. So two branches plus the normalization of 10 would be the fitness in this case. And if you have fitness equal to zero, then you found the target. I think it's kind of screwy that as things get more fit, it goes towards zero. So in mind, as things get more fit, it gets the number gets bigger, just because it makes more sense to me. But that's sort of the, um, the standard way. This slide, all this slide is trying to tell you is that basically there's people out there doing this, um, particularly in situations where the software is safety critical. And this is a great example, by the way. Some people tell me, oh, you know, the now service is kind of lame. I don't like code execution. Well, I like code execution too. But guess what? If I'm on the iron lung, and send me denial of service in my iron lung. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's a bad thing. So here's an evolutionary testing. Here's some problems that, that you may have in evolutionary testing. We're trying to look at the code snippet on the left and look at where we're trying to get to. Slash less target again. Anybody see what the problem there is? Who sees it? Who's got a, tell me, tell me what the problem is here. Do we have any genetic algorithms people in the crowd? Do we have any professors at a university that do this for like a living? GA? That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, it's not that you'll never get to it. The problem is, is that we don't control that. So if flag, then target, but we control A and B, right? So the genetic algorithm doesn't really know how to deal with that because it doesn't control those inputs. Now, it's not too hard for the human to see, well, if you make A0 and B0, then the flag will be one, and then we'll get to target. You can see that by analyzing the code, and it's not too hard to extend that. And um, there's people working on it. I'll show that on the, on the next slide. We're doing it's called extended chain approach to evolutionary testing. The next problem. So, by the way, if you're not a genetic algorithm guy, there's this notion called fitness landscape, and that basically means like you're trying to search for this, and you want a continuous function from where you are to that, so you're sort of hill climbing, right? And uh, that the flat means that when it sees if flag target, it doesn't know how to climb anymore. It just does so it's basically a random search. It might still get there actually, but it, it's random. It has to just start using random numbers for the inputs. It doesn't it doesn't know how to search intelligently at that point. So it reverts to what they call random search. But even worse than flat spots in your fitness landscape are deceptive spots. Can anybody look at the code snippet on the right? Come back. 30 seconds, pull back. Code snippet on the right, see what the target is. What Anybody see what the problem there might be? So in that case, they call that a deceptive landscape. And these two guys, McMahon and Mike Holcomb, they're working on solving those problems with an extended chain approach. You can check out the reference on the thing that they did So, but what I proposed is not that. All that was to give you background, just so you know about evolutionary testing. Mine doesn't use source code, because in my life, I don't have source code, right? I'm looking for a bug in Word or something like that. I don't have a source code to work. So, um, I'm talking about gray box evolutionary testing, in which case we'll use, um, I'll explain it again, we'll use the PIDA file from my data program that set breakpoints on functions and uh, stock as a chart. We'll talk about that. So that was all section one. We're done with that. Now we're on section two, which is how does the system actually go work? It takes evolutionary testing and fuzzing, a previous tool I wrote called GPF, and um, leverages PyMain. 
and use Docker and Pytorch and all that good stuff. And here's the system here. So on the lower left, you see a terminated right up there. You gotta look this way. So GPF is what you see, and that's got the guts, the evolutionary guts is right there. And then you see the target process is being stocked by the debugger in my name, and that's all the Python code. They, they both store everything in a MySQL database, and you can do the reports along with some PHP scripts from that. So the simple little protocol that they talk, GPFS, um, the I call it the EFS GUI or the Python bit or G or whatever you want to call it. It's all EFS is like the whole system. And then each bit, you know, kind of has different names based on what it was on the GPS part. Are you ready? It says, you know, are you ready? He says, yeah, I'm ready. And he starts stopping the process. And then um, GPS communicates with the process. And then Pyme stores the hit information. Okay, and so the stocking, I, I don't remember, I think I mentioned that later, but basically, a pitify, you know what a is? You know what a pitify is? So you take the binary. You stick it in the IDA Pro and you run pin it down line. Pin it down basically after IDA Pro, if it was able to successfully analyze the binary you want to stop, it's, it gives it basically a list of all the functions and all the, all the basic blocks. So you know what a function is? A basic block is like, you know, when there's assembly, you know, push, push, pop, jump, that's a basic block. Whenever there's a branch, those are the basic blocks. So you can have a list of breakpoints for all the functions and blocks. And it'll record all the either function or basic blocks that were hit during the session that was played. That's going to be a big part of how fitness is calculated. Um, you can choose which you want to stop on the function or basic blocks. So, um, in the <laughs> genetic algorithms, there's also something called genetic programming. This is it's basically a variable linked GA. It's not genetic programming because we're not trying to find snippets of code. We're working on data like the genetic algorithm does. And um, it's all custom code that I wrote. So basically, the fitness function is in how many functions or basic blocks can be hit, and also how diverse are the various sections, because we want to maintain a measure of diversity throughout. Okay, and I'll talk more about that. So here's my little corollary in academic account word right now, if that's even the right usage of corollary, but one and two, I have just a few thoughts basically is what they are. Code coverage doesn't equal security necessarily, so if you get complete code coverage of the attack surface, it doesn't mean that you found all the bugs, but if you haven't got all the code coverage, then you've got even less security, right? So if you haven't got all the bugs, so that's just sort of, that makes sense, we know that. I talked about that last year, but it not get that done. Um, so basically, the best I know how to do is get 100% coverage of the, of the attack surface if you can measure all the code on the attack surface when you know what it is and you cover it all. That's good. Plus, if you have diverse sessions with fuzzing heuristics throughout, that's even better. So that's just sort of the best I know how to do. Okay, so how does the actual evolution work? We'll talk about um, the actual basically main right now. So, but first, I mentioned that it's in the meters of the bullet, so that means the best session or pool. And I'll talk about the data structure in just a second. Gets carried over to the next, gen next generation automatically. That's called the legalism of war. So one automatically gets carried over. You never lose the best to the next generation. So then we have session crossover, session mutation, pool crossover, pool mutation. We'll talk about that right after I explain the data structure. So the data is laid out such that you can have multiple pools. The idea with multiple pools is that it helps maintain diversity, which helps maintain attack service coverage, which helps you find more bugs. So, the smallest bit of data is called the token, and you can kind of see that this is, um, it was developed a while ago with network type protocols in mind, so like reads and nights and stuff, but it can be extended to files as well, and that's one of the sort of future goals I mentioned at the end. So a token might be like a string, like Jared or something, and then space, and then user, or user space Jared, or something like that. That could be three tokens that make up a leg, and the leg is like a reader or a write, and multiple legs are in a session. So in a pool can have multiple sessions, so no problem there. Uh, so here you go, here's A and B. They're the two, you know, best looking folks. Right? They've got the best fitness. They get together, bada bing, bada boom, they produce two kids, A prime, B prime. And the way they do that is called single point crossover. So you pick a random spot in the tokens, draw a line, you read up to that line for A prime, and then after the red line, B to get A prime, and then the opposite for B prime up to the red line of A and then after the red line of A. So you have two new sessions that are hopefully more fit than the other ones. 
Session mutation doesn't necessarily mean mutation in the, in the dumb, fuzzy, simple sense that you're just like flipping bits. You could, that's part of it, that's one heuristic, right? But um, the type of the token makes a big difference in terms of how it's fudged, because you see like one, one token was called nasty space and then it got changed to a type of mix. Well, same thing as like if something's an ASCII command, that's sort of like the subject, and you want to fuzz that a little less than something that's called an ASCII command variable or a verb. You want to fuzz that a little bit more, right? So it's sort of like, you know, one is the, the subject, you know, one's basically the argument, word generator in the case, essentially the argument. So you might fuzz that a little more often. One of the fuzzy heuristics would be like format string heuristics, you see your sentence being inserted in there. And the reader rate could change something like that. So pool crossover, very similar to session crossover, same sort of idea. Draw a line somewhere in the pool, and then take both sessions above it to one, and the sessions below it the other, and then the inverse together to create two new pools. You want to create pools a little, you want to read pools a little less frequently than sessions. So sessions should be greeted basically every generation, creates the next generation. You don't want to continually read pools, maybe only every nine generations or something like that. You can set all it's all configurable. Commutation would be adding or deleting a session. You kind of keep, you're sort of injecting some fresh blood maybe once in a while and get very frequently when you do this. <clears throat> okay, so I'm a very like showing kind of learner. This is just a simple example of showing maybe in generation, a couple of the stuff, you know, in three sessions, maybe they look something like this. And you see what's called the basic blocks, and I think those are in the next slide. Yeah, the C file, I'll talk about those in a couple of slides. But Basically, for protocols, you want to give them some building blocks to work with. It's kind of just like randomly, when it's first initialized, you kind of just have a lot of random data with some random blocks kind of tossed in there. But then you see by generation 15, it's kind of got a user, and then some junk, and then a, a line feed, right? And then pass, and some junk, and then a character return line feed. So that, dinner, that session, you say this where it would actually have some decent fitness, right? It was essentially trying to log in to run two valid commands. That would get parsed. So you can see it's sort of getting fit, a little more fit over time. That's just a simple kind of contrived example. These are the parameters you can give the GPF. Yeah, evolutionary parameter being the most important, the number of pools, the max number of sessions in a pool, the max number of legs in a session, the max number of tokens in a leg, max number of generations you want, and all that kind of stuff you can configure. And it has like sort of default right parameters that are kind of these, but it kind of depends a lot on the protocol, on the application, and stuff like that. You know, for example, if you're fuzzing a binary protocol that you know for sure only ever accepts one packet, you know, like DFB or something, you just, you just send it something and it never gives anything back, and that's it. Well, it's okay. You could have a lot of sessions in the generation. I guess you know, pull up. I mean, you would, you know, you keep testing it. But having a lot of legs in the session, like you're kind of expecting, you know, write or read or read, or it's not really going to do as much, but you never know. It doesn't generally hurt. It. It'll still, like, the evolution is just sort of overcoming that. Because it doesn't really care anymore. It just, it does something. It gets fit. It's whatever it did. It doesn't really care. If it was fit, it'll run, you know, kind of thing. But you can kind of push it along. And that's the idea of the C file. The idea of the C file is that, you know, Genetic algorithms, they can search and find stuff like completely randomly, but it would take forever. Like, so supposedly you were buzzing SMTP, and one of the strings that needs to be in there is like mail from. Well, it'll eventually randomly come up with a string mail from, but it might take like 100 years or something, right? So you kind of see the evolutionary fuzzer with what they call, this is like a genetic algorithm term, the building blocks, the low level things that you know somewhere need to be recombined and put in there somehow, maybe you don't know how, but you don't care how, but they need to be in there somewhere. Those are really important. So it's important to have a good C file. It really helps the evolution a lot. So that's kind of the GPF side of things. Back to um, more of the uh, eStalker side of things. Maybe you can create that PIDA file, use an IDA pro. Um, and then it's really important to know what your application is because if you've got a user land app, you know, or if you've got like, a Windows service, various things. They start and stop differently. If they crash, like when the service maybe kicks it right back up. Things like you need to know how the application operates so that you can configure the GUI portion of DFS to deal with that properly. Like if it does stop, you know, how does it restart it? Those kind of things. You need to know all that. And then um, this is actually a big thing right here: filtering common breakpoints. <coughs> so, and I give an example of kind of measuring attack surface versus like other startup and stop and stuff like that. So. Actually, starting an application, say it's a network application, connecting to it with TV, TCP, sending some junk, disconnecting, and then closing the application, actually, like that, that involves.
almost a lot of the code. That could be, say, like 30% of the total application could be just that. And that's not what you want to test, right? You want to test the parts of your team that you deliver meaningful code. So you want to filter all that out. You can do that with these doctor by like, just doing, doing it manually. And then I think I show one of the pictures over right here. I don't know if you can see it coming down, but there's like a little red pair of scissors. See that in the, uh, in the data source stuff in the upper left hand corner? You may probably see that thing, but that's basically what the little red scissors do with VStalker. You're sort of saying, I don't want to see that. Because what happens is that substantially slows down the program. If it has to, every session, it has to do like 30% of that work, like you don't want that. So filter that out. That's very, very critical. And this picture just shows all the options. By the way, uh, you can go to my website and download the cell phone source. So you can grab all the slides, the paper, EFS, GPF, it's all there. Go ahead and go get it. Mentioning your paper, like I said. So, um, good. So that was section two. Section one was the background. Section two was how does the system actually work? And then section three is going to be evaluating a little bit. So, main thing we'll be talking about the benchmarking. We can talk about the tax surface, some protocols are created. Is it better to stock on functions or basic blocks? And how do tools work? Do they maintain diversity? What about um, the niching? There's another thing I added, diversity. Did, did that work? And there's more to come on the benchmark paper will be available on our website as well at some point on media.com. So, uh, basically, the important thing is if you're wondering yourself, I wonder how Spike does against Sully, or Sully does against EFS, or whatever, you want to sort of measure how well these two, and I think Charlie does actually talk a little bit about that, that kind of about measuring um, some, maybe not this year. No, he's not about measuring some intelligence at that time. Anyway, there will be, you'll see more of these, right? People are going to start doing this, they're going to start wanting to know and wonder which of these is actually better, right? One way you can do that is you can write a text based server or binary based server that you can actually do some benchmarking. And you can insert like bugs that are easy to find and maybe a basic, you know, stir copy type overflow early in the protocol. And then you can like embed things like a really niche corner hard to like ever think about find deep overflow somewhere way down the protocol or something. And see if it ever finds it. Does it ever evolve and actually find it? I haven't actually done that bit yet, but that's to come. So the text server works like this. There's three settings, low, medium, and high. What those basically mean is it controls the amount of attack surface that's available. And I call it pass, one pass, nine pass, or ten key pass. And basically the way I do that is the protocol is something that it says high, and you say command one. Or in the case of me, it's like it allows one through four, and high it's like one through nine or something. So you can give it varying, you know, like separating stuff based on what setting it's on. That, that's a lot, that, that allows me to sort of test well, does it work well against applications that have really small text versions and maybe only one build out of that? Or does it work better with just like multiple paths? <laughs> if there's multiple paths, then you need more diverse sessions, right? Not one, not have any one session with a couple of those paths. So it allows you to kind of think about those sort of, sorts of things, which are important and fuzzy, very important. So, and then this is command one ready, and then you give it like another number of three, and it says sub command three, okay, and then you send this screen, calculate character line might be. And it sends you back the answer, basically just adds them up. So EFS needs to learn this protocol. That's the thing. And I give it um, this C file right here. Goes, that's all I give it to start with. Just some numbers, the string calculate, the string command, and the string character line. It would find the character line because you have a problem because that's actually a reason that's built in. So it sticks like space in the character line. It's, it has some things that it can find pretty easily on time. I stick it anyway to kind of oversee it. You can actually you can oversee it more than that. Like if you know character line beats are really important, you can put like 10 of them in these files or something so that it has a higher probability. Basically when it builds random sessions at the beginning, it has like a 60% chance of grabbing a seat from the file and shuffling with random data. You know, so a lot of this is like how the six are when you six in the result graphs at the end. All the graphs aren't like perfectly smooth, right? Because the genetic developers kind of slam around. But even the best sessions, when they're supposed to read, they don't read all the time. They just have a higher probability of reading. So it's kind of like that. So when you mentioned the text server, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is on text server on the median setting. Just starting it and stopping it was 137 basic blocks out of 597. So that's 23% of the code. But the total code is just starting and stopping the application. So you can see how filtering that's kind of critical. Here again, uh, we see the network actually, like, just like the things that you set and received, just grabbing a TCP connection was 15 basic blocks. And the parsing, which is by the way, the only part, if, the, if this is the only type service you have in this application, this is the only bit that could contain bugs. So, I mean, there could be bugs in the other part, but you can't test it in the real attack, right? 
And that's this whole deal with fuzzing. Like, you know, there's no privilege network, data has no privileges, applications running as bad as it is. If you run a net code, you can have privilege escalation. That's the whole key with the kind of time zone, right? So um, it's a total tax service. In this case, it's only 18%. And a large amount of code is just not accounted for. It's just like functions. And I actually looked through, um, I mean, you probably see what it is. It's just stuff that gets linked in and various stuff that you'll just never hit. It. It's kind of wild, but there's a, there's a large portion of code that really just doesn't need used. <coughs> so if this didn't have any trouble learning this language, we found the best session quickly. Uh, but it didn't cover the entire tax service. Does anybody know why it didn't? Come back for a second, as one in 30 seconds should check why, right? Why, why would it miss? So, I think I stated it. Basically, think error cases and corner cases. So, if you go back to the protocol, what happens, say, uh, like, I guess it would be uh, like the third, the second, like you're sending why? What if you don't send it a valid number that it accepts, right? Well, it probably tells you something like you know, try again or bad number. So, there's there's more to the protocol than I showed you, right? And that's always the case. There's always error conditions and things like that, and shuffling of commands. What if you send calculate up front? Does it, you know, you know, you need to those all those things need to be tested, right? So it's possible that you could get a session fitness that's better than just the base case. And the base case might be, you know, like say ten functions we ran just perfect. Actually, in this case, it's six. I think not me. But you might find seven in there, right? Because there's an error function in or something. So, um, and I show all that. So the binary server is very much like the text server, except for it has it's very binary. It starts with a total length of the packet, four bytes, the first four bytes, session ID, four bytes, next four bytes. The command length is a two byte length, and then the command string that you send, right? So that's a very binary sort of protocol. And learning and fuzzing these kind of protocols is different than a text protocol, right? Because they're a lot less forgiving. And the response is very much the same. So, um, if, that, if I shouldn't have too much trouble, I actually have a previous test, and I shouldn't have too much trouble doing that because I can deal with links. I don't have any sort of hashing or encrypting token base types in EFS, so if it's like an encrypted protocol, I'm going to be able to learn that. But I know Charlie's um, doing some programming and stuff too, and he said he tried to get some binary protocol and works. So, um, here's, here's a, this is basically the point of this is to show you which is better, functions or basic class? Which one should I stop on? Doing any kind of stuff, but in particular with EFS. Um, and the answer is what I found anyway is that if it's a small application, really small, like very small number of functions, use basic blocks because it's not a granular enough fitness function. And there's like in this case, there's only six possible functions when it's running on a low setting that it can find. So the, the fitness, the fitness landscape is too flat. It might find it, but it might not. And in this case, when I ran it, it didn't only find four or six functions. Textures, right? But with basic blocks, it's on 40 or 37, meaning if the hit must have found an error condition or something, right? That would be better than the base case. So it did much better in this case with um, basic blocks because it's such a small application when it's set to run up. And you notice, and you'll see this in other slides, you see the green line on top? That's like total diversity. And then the fitness is the red line on top. You see how they converge essentially? So as, one set, all, as the sessions in the pool, basically become like the best session, they lose their diversity. They all become like one guy, essentially. You see the diversity go down. That's called convergence in genetic algorithms. But when you run it on medium, uh, you see that the one running the functions actually did quite well. And it's, it does better, really, in a way, because it runs faster, runs much faster, doesn't have to get as many breakpoints. Because essentially, what each of those hits is, is just a breakpoint. In the application, right? So it's like it hits this, it onsets a breakpoint, it's not onsets a breakpoint. So the more breakpoints it has to hit, the slower it's going to run. So um, it found all six in the base case, and the diversity was 20 out of 22 on the total attack surface coverage here. So that's pretty good. They just said basically the attack surface. And running it with basic blocks did almost the same, almost as good, and you see again that sort of conversion. So you could see the one that's okay for in this case. It was granular enough to go to functions. It's just a grass that looks pretty. One thing you might notice, I go back to that. The grass is a little, little prettier with uh, basic black because it's a little more granular, so you can see the trends easier and the functions sometimes. Um, so, testing effects of pools. Pools did work to achieve better diversity, but they didn't cover 100% of the attack surface. And we show that um, in the upcoming slide how they did and how it compares with. Niching, niching, speciation, diversity, it's kind of all the same, or a little different. I'm sure we could 
there and get you know, best way to get a lot of endpoints in there. Well, what those terms mean? Well, for me, basically, what it means is this fitness function I mentioned earlier as being code coverage plus diversity. Well, okay, a little more, I guess, fully defined is hits, either function or basic class, doesn't matter. Hits plus the diversity metric is unique divided by best times best minus one. Now, if you're like me at all, which is scary, but if you were, I'm like a very visual learner, right? So show me how that works. Okay, so let's just show you. Instead of talking about that, we'll just look at an example. Right? So here's the first issue. So the best session in this case gets 10 hits. And you see it's A, B, C, D, W, H, I, J. And those represent what well, those letters represent. And then you know, just like you can track some code, right? So A might be 0, 8, 0, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's just something that has some function or some basic line. It hit that great point. Seven was A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And uh, the, the least fifth one was D, W, X, Y, Z. And so, you know, it's natural to sort of say, well, I guess session three doesn't have as high a chance to read because it's not very fit, which is true. But if you look at it, it's also very diverse, right? It's sort of like all these big companies that want to hire diverse people and stuff because diverse people bring new ideas. And that's, like, that's fairly true, right? The news group. So, you don't want to penalize five for being so low in fitness but because it's so diverse. So what you do is you take his unique hits, which in his case all five of his hits were unique, and times it by the best minus one, and his total fitness ends up being better than the other guy, which I think is appropriate because if you look, the guy who's seven hits, he's basically like an immature version of the guy above him. He's, he's going to be like him pretty soon, probably. Chances are he's headed in that, down that evolutionary track, right? He wants to be you know, the doctor, when he goes up with the five-hit guy, he wants to be a fireman or something. He wants to be totally different. We want to encourage that sort of diversity because you're going to get more coverage in the attack service. And this is sort of the proof of that, right? As much as you can get for kind of running tests. But basically, in the first case, the very one to the left, because they're kind of all shuffled to get them on one slide, and that's kind of a bit. I think it works. You see the diversity going basically straight down, because I only ran in one pool. So a whole bunch of sessions in one pool, and as everybody gets like the session in one pool, there's that convergence I'm talking about. So the, the fitness matches the diversity at some point they convert. Well, when you run it with multiple pools, they did better. See, the total diversity of people is 87, thank you. So it got seven, about seven other things that the other pool didn't. And you see the trend is kind of up and down in terms of total diversity, right? Because as the pools breed and cross over and stuff, there's kind of that slamming around that happens in the GA. And then in the last case, when I turn diversity out, which is you know, I'm giving that extra boost to the guys who are a little more diverse, the total peak was 107, so it did way better. So diversity is clearly a good thing to do in terms of, you want to boost the fitness of guys that are diverse if you want to maintain coverage and tax shows. Okay, so that was section three, that was the benchmarking. Section four is actual results run against a couple of things on gold MTP and IIS MTP and SMTP. So has anybody heard of gold MTP? Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Don't use it. <laughs> It's fun to fuzz, yeah. It's freeware, so I don't give guys a hard time when they release freeware because it's free, right? But it's loaded with bugs. So I didn't find any of us found, like, I don't know, quite a few. And I didn't find any actual, like, crashes or OAs loading INS, but I did find some instabilities, but I wasn't able to track down, like, every once in a while, long runs, it would actually crash. But I think it was more just the starting and stopping with the debugger and stuff like that than the actual session. That was never able to pin down. SMTP in, in particular did crash you know, after a day of running or something, but I could never trace back any one session that did that. So I just sort of have to assume that things started and stopped and unfavorable to it. So, um, and we should test it anymore. Please go down with my code, test the drone, find out the it's a little more of a setup, I will warn you that setting the system up because you have to have MySQL running, you gotta have you know, GPF and EFS installed, which is no problem. Getting the graphs in particular takes a little bit because you have to install JP graph on um, whatever. Yeah, which is kind of Oh yeah, and you have to you know, you have to have ID Pro and you have to get a file from ID. So there is a little setup with the system as compared to just you know taking a word file, writing it through 50 bits and giving it to work, right? That's the that's easy. This is a little harder than that. So I should just keep warning about that. So this is like when I first got my first cut of the code running a long time ago, and I really wasn't even sure this would work, because I didn't know anything about evolutionary algorithms at the time, and I was kind of convinced in my own mind that just kind of randomly. Picking data and putting together whatever doing anything meaningful. 
But what I didn't know is when you installed one that to me, because I had been testing it at this point, when, when a user logs in, it makes that little you know, popping little bubble pops down and it pops up and the user logs in, I was like, whoa, look at that. It learned how to log in. It was like Google said it actually worked, right? So that was really a surprise, frankly. But, so it does actually work, which is a good thing. And the next slide here, you see uh, it finding a crash. It's writing a crash dump to the screen. It writes as well to the file, and then as well, it writes all the crash information to the SQL database. You can query. You can create all kinds of nice, pretty little graphs, like you found X number of uh, crashes at this address, right? Because it's going to keep finding the same crash over and over again at some point until it learns how to do a different session or whatever. So it might find 10,000 of the same crash before it moves on. And you sort of only want to report that essentially once, probably, you know. So this is, um, you can see some of the kind of flatness in the landscape. This is showing us an old picture, an old graph that I took. Um, and I've graphed it something now, but. Um, you can kind of see, see where it's kind of cruising along flat and whoop, it went up. That's, where, I mean, that's when I did the little bubble pop, right? That's when I learned how to log in. And then shortly after that, the blue lines indicate crash numbers. So as soon, right after I learned how to log in, it started crashing pretty quickly after that, right? And then here's a sort of smooth down version of the average fitness and average crashes per generation. Kind of, you see the same sort of trend, right? And this slide is just sort of more confirmation of what we saw in the previous slide. I see the green line, it's really hard to see because it's kind of picture over a lot of different runs, but there's a green line that kind of keeps going up. It's showing that the fit has kind of kept getting better than multiple pools. Those were not. You see the, other, the red line kind of going down in one pool. Similar sort of thing. And this graph sort of shows the crashes. And the point of this graph is to show you that the, the, um, the runs that had 10 pools found more unique crashes. Uh, I don't actually even count, but the ones we will find like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 crashes where the temple found 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 unique crashes. So you can sort of see that having multiple pools fostered diversity, which fostered finding different bugs, right? Okay. So that brings us to the end of section 4, basically to the end of the talk. Um, what do I want to do? Where's it going? What was hard? I mean, talk about some of the challenges of the system. Talk about um, wanting to port it to files. I've got about half ported to working with files as well. Um, needs more comparison in terms of how does this do against just like, you know, an uh, Axie type compliant fuzzer, you know, and writing a NDB fuzzer and like a spike fuzzer or something like that to do as well. It certainly would take a little longer to kind of get this punchline. I think we do. Overall, at the end, I think it would be a little more diversion to we'll come up with cases. Because what happens when you write a traditional sort of, you know, protocol or fuzzer, it's like you, you sort of tell the, the script, you know, this is user, this is pass, fuzz that, um, then this, then fuzz that. It sort of does those, but it doesn't very minimally, right? It'll, it'll fuzz all its test cases against user, then it'll do all its test cases against pass. And it's never really like, what if you gave it kind of a weird treat for user and like a weird command way down here? It doesn't do a lot of like really diverse shuffling or fuzz. And this will do that, right? It's doing all kinds of great stuff. You can kind of see what it's doing by just going to my SQL database, that's the generation 100. You can dump the session, dump the best session, just look at it and see, wow, that's weird. I, I often did that throughout the stuff. I thought, man, how is that a valid session? I'm thinking about like, it. Because a lot of them look ugly, right? Because it's got all kinds of crappy data and binary stuff and character line things everywhere. You're thinking to yourself, that is not a valid FTP session, but Look through it, and I'm like, oh, okay, so the big more tech, there's a line feed after that. Oh, there's a user name in here, so it, it's finding stuff that's really ugly, but it works. So the bit files are a pain. Speed rating is a little tricky, too, because what happens is it has to like start and stop stalking every time for every session. So the rate needs to be just right such that the GPF is done sending you know, a bunch of sessions to the target under stock. You got to maybe wait just a little bit for it to finish because sometimes the device is just a hair behind and stop stalking and then write those things to the database. And if there's any problem with that timing, what can happen is you can get the next guy, the next session that comes in, it was still maybe hitting the last few breakpoints of the first one, and he sort of gets a few extra fitness hits from the guy that weren't his, and then it won't involve right if it's getting, because then it'll think that one's better than it was, so when it plays with the next generation, it's going to be crap, right? So with the rate and timing can be a little tricky. Uh, binary protocols need more testing. And then there's just the normal challenges of debugging and starting and stopping doing services or whatever you're going after. There's just sort of normal testing, instrumentation, monitoring, logging, statistics, the whole bit kind of could go along with the testing in general. 
Those are some of the um, references. Those are the things people have. So at this time, I'd like to open it up for all the questions you may have. Go ahead. So uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Don't leave just here for lunch. I think you'll be mad if I let you go a half hour early. That's a big cheating, right? You get there first. So go ahead. 